Welcome again to Storm and Presbyterian Church, to our online service. It's so good to have you join us as we worship together. This is a, 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 an occasion, an opportunity for us uh, to take time to, to pause in our uh, frantic lives and to reflect on the love and grace and goodness of God. We live in a fractured world and we see the evidence of that all around us. We live in a world struggling to relate in a way that helps the, the other to flourish. We live in a world that can leave us feeling dejected and hopeless. We come in Jesus' name to meet today because in Jesus we are offered healing where there's brokenness in Jesus we are offered hope where there's hopelessness in Jesus we are offered a new beginning to begin again when we turn and trust and follow him Will you join me now as we talk to God, as we bring to him our hopes and expectations, as we invite him to meet with us? Let's pray together. Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we bless and we thank you for this opportunity to spend a little time together worshipping to spend time reading and reflecting on your word, to spend time listening for your voice. We bless and thank you that you're a God who is not silent, but a God who speaks. You're a God who's not absent, but a God who is present. You're a God who does not withhold but a God who longs and loves and desires more than anything to pour out his blessing. We recognise, Father, that our lives are a mess. We recognise that we, we say and do things that, uh, that we know in our own hearts we shouldn't, never mind looking at what you expect of us. We add to the the brokenness all around us. And we bring all of that baggage with us when we come to worship. We can't seem to let go of it ourselves. We come and ask for your Holy Spirit to come and forgive us, to take that baggage away, to allow us to begin again to turn and trust and believe in your son. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending him into the world, not just to be our teacher and, and our guide and our helper, to be our savior, to lay down his life for us. As we think on that today, will you speak through your spirit into our hearts and minds? And will you draw us to yourself? Come near to us as we come near to you. Hear this, our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us pray to God our Father, who tenderly cares for his people and listens when we call out to him with our concerns for all who are in need. The Good Shepherd goes before his sheep, guiding them in the right direction. We pray for the leaders of our nation that they may be examples to the citizens of our land and that they may, be, they may govern the people as you, our Good Shepherd, did with justice, righteousness, compassion and mercy, honesty and integrity, and always having at heart the people they govern. To the Good Shepherd, all his sheep are important. May each of us come to understand that ultimately our experience of freedom, justice and peace is inextricably linked to the freedom, justice and peace of every other person in our city our country and our world. May all of us come to acknowledge the racism that is pervasive in our nation and around the world. Help each of us to love our neighbour and to do everything in our power to eradicate this hatred from our society. The Good Shepherd cares for his sheep. With our focus on coronavirus, it is easy to forget that famine continues to be a worldwide problem with hundreds of millions of people suffering. We pray for all those agencies and individuals who are working to bring relief to these areas in order to alleviate the suffering and distress. In our own city and country, we pray for all those who are struggling financially at this time, some perhaps for the first time dependent on charity. We pray that they will have the courage to seek help and that you will support and sustain them. We remember all those who seek to fulfil your command to love one another through the work of food banks, charities and simple acts of kindness. Lord, help us all to respond to suffering, poverty and hunger in ways that usher in your kingdom. The Good Shepherd knows his sheep one by one and can call them by name. Lord, we ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit on the two congregations now using our building and to give us a renewed vision of your purpose for us in this local community. We pray for our church family, led by our pastor Alban, whose teaching inspires us with the message of your salvation. We pray for those who feel overwhelmed by the challenges of each day, for those adapting to new ways of living, for those who are ill, for those close to death, for those who are grieving. May we always encourage each other in the times of blessing and in the times of trial. Heavenly Father, we are your people and we thank you for your care and protection. Accept these prayers and bring to all for whom we have prayed your blessings of love, joy and peace. We ask this in the name of the one true shepherd, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The reading is John 10 verses 11 to 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep who do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. 
I came across a story this week about a man called James Reddick. He was a dentist and he had a real passion and love for mountain hiking. So much so that one particular weekend he took his 12 year old daughter and his 11 year old son and they went to enjoy and experience mountain hiking uh, near where they lived. Um, it was Mount Rainier, which you'll find about 59 miles southeast of Seattle in Washington State. They were enjoying their time together. That was until they were overtaken by a sudden storm. They were being hit with hurricane force winds, with wet, sleety snow. They were experiencing a whiteout. They couldn't see, they couldn't move. So James Reddick decided that he would dig a trench in the snow. He wrapped his children in their sleeping bags. He put them as far away from the entrance to the trench as he could. And he used a piece of tarpaulin to act as a, a covering for the entrance. But the wind was just too strong and it kept lifting the tarpaulin. So what he ended up doing was using his body weight to hold down the edge of the tarpaulin. Two days later, the search and rescue crew discovered James and his children. They noticed the corner of a rucksack jutting out from the snow and they furiously began to dig away and to their delight and amazement they discovered the children, the 12 year old daughter, the 11 year old son, safe and well and alive. But they also discovered James Reddick, his cold, stiff body, lying up against the wall of snow in this snow cave. One of the searchers was quoted as saying, he chose the cold spot and he laid down his life for his children. In John chapter 10 and in verse 11, we find Jesus making this declaration about himself. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And in that statement, he brings together this image of caring and nurturing and, and looking after that comes through with that image of a shepherd alongside this sacrifice, this laying down of life. Now, as I read and reread this statement of Jesus, I was struck by two things. Two things kind of grabbed me from what Jesus says here. First of all, it's the use of the word good, because he repeats it. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So that caught my eye. And then this phrase, lays down his life for the sheep. So why does Jesus use good shepherd as the title? In all the other I am sayings, there is no adjective attached to the noun. So in chapter 6, it's I am the bread of life. In chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Beginning of chapter 10, I am the gate. Um, in chapter 11, I am the resurrection. In chapter 14, I am the way. And in chapter 15, I am the vine. It's only here, midway through chapter 10, that Jesus attaches an adjective to the noun and says, I am the good shepherd. So why does he do that? Why does he place good alongside shepherd? Well, his contemporaries would have understood all too well why Jesus attacks the word good to shepherd and what he was trying to communicate. We sometimes can have a an idealized picture of a shepherd, maybe because of this title, Good Shepherd. But Jesus' contemporaries knew 
that not every shepherd was a good shepherd. Not every shepherd had the welfare of the sheep uppermost in their mind. In this profession, as in any other walk of life, there are those who are honest and committed and faithful and those who are not. Jesus is making it clear that he is different from those that they will have experienced before. Because along with this image of, of shepherd and sheep, for his contemporaries, that that title was pregnant with spiritual meaning and spiritual significance. In the Old Testament, the first 39 books of our Bible and the bedrock of the Jewish faith, shepherd is a title that denotes uh, taking care of God's people. It flows from the fact that God himself is revealed as the shepherd of Israel. And those who, who are appointed as leaders under God share in that title, share in that responsibility to care for, to look after God's people. But as we read our way through the Old Testament narrative, we discover that not every shepherd, not every leader is a good shepherd or a good leader. Some are more concerned about their own position and their own circumstances rather than the welfare of the lives of those whom they have responsibility for. Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd, and in doing so, he's setting himself apart from the shepherds or leaders that the people will have experienced thus far. Jesus is not like them, nor will he be like them. Verse 14 he makes this comment, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Jesus creates in our minds here a picture of intimacy and of trust and of relationship. Jesus is not in the business of, of grabbing power. He's not power hungry. He's not status seeking. Jesus invests himself, invests his life in those he's come to serve. And as he will soon demonstrate those whom he's come to save. Now alongside setting himself apart from the rogue leaders, Jesus' use of the adjective good points to his relationship with God. You look at Luke's gospel account. He records a conversation between Jesus and a certain ruler. You'll find it in chapter 18. Of Luke's gospel and, and this is how the conversation goes the the ruler says to Jesus good teacher what must I do to inherit eternal life and Jesus first response is to say why do you call me good no one is good except God alone Luke 18 verses 18 and 19 no one is good except God alone Yet here in John chapter 10 at verse 11 and again at verse 14, Jesus declares, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is good not only because he's different from the other leaders. He's good because of his relationship with the Father. Verse 15, the Father knows me and I know the Father. Verse 17, the reason the Father loves me. The verse 18, the command I received from my Father. Jesus wants his listeners to grasp and to understand that his shepherding, his leadership, his investment, his care will be like nothing else they've ever experienced. What's more, it will be like God's shepherding, God's leading, God's investing, God's care, because Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Verse 11. Unlike the hired hands who abandon the flock and flee at the first sign of danger, the shepherd faces, the good shepherd that is, faces the danger for the sheep, on behalf of the sheep, in the place of the sheep. 
For their sake, he lays down his life. The sheep are not only unaware of the life-threatening nature of the danger, they are ill-equipped to respond. Abandoned by hired hands, they scatter and the danger swallows them up. The good shepherd, on the other hand, brings them together. Verse 16, one flock. And in laying down his life, the sheep receive life. So a good shepherd knows the dangers that the flock faces. And he's prepared to put his life on the line. Now, it may not be a very flattering comparison, but we, that's you and me, we're as ill-equipped as sheep, and the truth be told, we're as ill-informed. There is a reality presented in the scriptures that our modern mindset rejects as out-of-date, scaremongering. The Bible speaks of sin and rebellion towards God. It speaks of the consequences of our sin in terms of judgment and death. And it speaks of all of this as a clear and present danger. Now, you and I are not strangers to threats and danger. In fact, wherever we turn, there are warning signs uh, making it clear that danger is imminent. From caution, wet floor signs through to loose rocks, liable to fall signs. We know that danger is all around us. And this pandemic that we've been living through has only served to heighten that for us, at least on a physical level. And yet the dangers that Jesus lays down his life to save us from are dangers that no amount of health and safety regulation or mitigation can save us from. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, expressed it in this way. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 22 to 23. And later in that same letter, Paul underlines the consequences of sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Jesus, the good shepherd, knows our greatest need. And his mission, his purpose, is to meet that need for us. Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Christianity is all about rescue. Jesus is all about rescue. The gospel, the good news, is all about rescue. When we gather as a faith community, as we're doing right now, we do so to celebrate what God has done for us. Not to parade and present what we have done for him, Christianity is all about rescue. It's the main theme of the Bible. Matthew 1, 21, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Luke 19, verse 10, The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. 1 Timothy 1, 5, The saying is sure and worthy of acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And 1 John 4, 14. We have seen and testified that the Father sent his Son as the Saviour of the world. Our sin, your sin and my sin, impacts our relationships with each other. Our sin shapes the way we view the world drives us to selfishness and separates us, alienates us from God. Evil 
is not something external to us that affects us. Evil's not the absence of education and social reform. The past century should show us that. That even with increased educational opportunities, even with investment in social reform, atrocities and conflicts, political oppression, discrimination, violence and crime, not only persist, but they flourish. Think about it. The society that you and I are part of is ordered and shaped on the assumption of human sin. The legislation, the laws of our land, they're there because we can't be trusted to settle disputes justly and without self-interest. Promises are not enough. We have to have written contracts. Doors are not enough. We need locks and bolts and high-tech security systems. Payment for fares, not enough. We need tickets to be inspected and collected. Law and order, we need police to enforce it. All of this is due to our sin, our brokenness and our failure, our missing the mark and our overstepping the mark. And the consequences? Alienation from God, enslavement to our own selfishness, and conflict with one another. And the answer? Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Through Jesus, we're reconciled to God. Through Jesus, we're born again and given a new nature. Through Jesus, we're welcomed into a family of faith where loving fellowship replaces discord and conflict. All this is ours through Jesus. He paid the price. He gave his life for this. Sin is not some minor flaw, a quirk of nature that can be dismissed with, oh, never mind. Sin leads to death. But when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's telling those who are listening that he will lay down his life, that they might know forgiveness and freedom and a hope-filled future through him. We get to begin again with Jesus. He invites us to turn to him, to come to him, to trust and believe in him and to begin again in him by the presence and power of his spirit that he places within us. Laying down his life is more than service. It's sacrifice. The cross of Jesus Christ stands as the greatest symbol of our sin and the greatest symbol of God's grace. Without the cross, we die. With the cross, we live. Christianity is all about rescue. The shepherd, the good shepherd, rescues his sheep by laying down his life for them. This is the gospel we believe in. This is the good news that reshapes and redefines our lives. This is the good news that you and I are called to proclaim. Jesus says to all of us this morning, I'm the good shepherd. Now we may have been following Jesus for a long, long time. But he says to us this morning, trust me and keep on trusting me. I am the good shepherd. We may never have considered following Jesus before. He says to us, trust me, turn to me, believe in me. I am the good shepherd. And Jesus says to all of us, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. As followers, you and I are forgiven when we turn and trust in him. We're set free. 
We're filled with his spirit to live hope-filled lives. Jesus calls us this morning. He does so by name. Look at verse 3 of John chapter 10. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And also in verse 3, the sheep listen to his voice. This morning, Jesus calls us by name. Will you follow? Will you keep on following? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for the words that we have been reading and reflecting upon and thinking about. We thank you that you have this love for us that, that even our language struggles to, to capture. That you looked at our brokenness and you looked at our failure and you looked at our sin and instead of turning your back upon us and walking away you were obedient to the plan that you and the Father and the Holy Spirit had forged and you stepped from eternity into time in order to lay down your life for us in order to pay the price in order to set us free, in order to reconcile us to the Father, in order to fill us with your Spirit, that we might live hope-filled lives. Lord Jesus, we thank you. This is good news. Help us to receive it, to embrace it. Help us to follow you today. Where we have been following for years, give us new strength, new focus. Place your hand upon us and guide our steps. Where we've never followed, but simply watched from afar and wondered, or try going it alone. We come to you today and we say sorry. We come to you today and we say, Lord, yes, I believe. Forgive my sin. Turn me around. Put your spirit within me and lead me into a hope-filled life. Hear this, our prayer. We ask it in your precious name. Amen.
We're going to say together a prayer that unites us as God's children to our Heavenly Father. It's the prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples. It's a prayer that gives us the shape and the rhythm of how we engage with God. So will you join me as we say these words together? Let's do that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ and the extravagant love of God the Father and the intimate friendship of God the Holy Spirit be with each one of you, now and always. Amen.